You're not following the election at all? Uh, not that election, no. No, no, I, I, I see, here's, here's my philosophy. I think of things in terms of technology and states of technology. And I think that um, coercive geographic based governance uh, is a form of technology that humanity has had for a while. Uh, but I think that it is on its way out. And I think that networks, digital networks, are the emerging form of governance. And so I kind of see all the things that you're talking about, um, the, the, the coercive geographic based governance as kind of like a like a sideshow like a clown show on its way out and and like you mentioned like with with the drug war and 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 private profit like prison like basically a lot of people in prison a lot of peaceful people in prison um i think it is all a direct a direct sign that the form of technology that caused those things to happen is well ready to be on its way out. It's, it's, it's a signal of decay. It's a signal of decline. And so I really just pay no attention to it whatsoever because I consider it a waste of my time. Although I agree with you that I think that centralized uh, regional governments are eventually on their way out because people will move to technology for various forms of governing each other, I, I couldn't disagree more with your outlook there because I just saw an article the other day. There was a man in Miami who was, I believe, incarcerated and I believe mentally ill. That was the allegation. And the, uh, the guards moved him as a punitive measure. The guards moved him into a shower, locked him in there, and kept it on full heat for about two hours. And apparently he was screaming to get out. This was one of the top news stories on Reddit the other day. He was screaming to get out until his skin fell off and he died. And apparently the prison guards called that practice slippage. It's slippage when the skin falls off. And we are in a population here in the United States that has the highest percentage of our own people in prison of any country in the world, even China, which puts a lot of people in prison, uh, percentage-wise, they put less people in prison than we do. And so until we put a full stop to the drug war and the prison, the private prison industrial complex, there are real people not that much different from me or you, who, because they live in the wrong state and have a weed pipe on them, or because of whatever circumstance, they don't get the experience that a well-connected Californian or well-connected New Hampshire resident gets. They get put into uh, something like that. And, and so to me, even though, yeah, a lot of this stuff, a lot of national politics strikes me as a distraction and a dog and pony show. But I don't want to remain silent because I do see a big difference in how we'd be governed if we got a Jeb Bush who would continue private prisons and continue that horrific stuff. Or if we got a Hillary Clinton who would just laugh when, when she's asked about that, you know, that kind of cruel laugh. To me, I see a difference between that and maybe getting somebody who's a little bit more of a rogue or whatever you want to call them. Get somebody who'd be like, wait a second, we got to stop doing this shit. We can't have people who are being put in the shower stalls and burned to death because we have this out of control private prison complex. But for some reason, the corporate media doesn't like to talk about how many people are going to prison for marijuana and how many people are going to prison for what amounts of thought crimes, you know, things that are nonviolent and there's no. There's no victim, right? Like, who's the victim when you have a weed pipe in Kansas and then you get put into a, a, a terrible private prison for five years and get raped every day? As I, I met a woman in Colorado who actually went to prison in Kansas and it changed her life. You know, it, that experience negatively impacted her life. And so that's why I speak about this stuff, not because I think it's perfect. And I realize that people have probably less influence than they should, but at least we have some options and I don't want to remain silent. And I couldn't agree with you more in terms of seeing truly horrible things happening and saying, wow, is there anything I can do to lessen this horrible thing that is happening to my fellow man, my God? And so then we must ask ourselves, okay, do well-intentioned people going to a vote voting booth of the system of coercive governance, does that work? Has it worked? It's been taking place every four years for the past, what, uh, over a hundred years, and it seems that the violence has only increased rather than decreased. So then we must ask ourselves, okay, perhaps is there a different way to vote? Perhaps are these people who are putting others in showers and killing them, perhaps are they, they being enabled to do that by this system having so much relevance and more accurately by this system having its own piggy bank, which I support every time I use their dollar. Well, now, now, you're, now you're hitting on something really interesting because uh, the reason why I've been so passionate about this stuff, uh, you know, I, I was always a journalist, so there was no, like, no expectation that I'd ever make a lot of money, right? Because you pretty much max out at 50K a year if you're an honest journalist anyway. It's not a lot of money in just writing and giving your opinions unless you go the CNN route. but. Uh, I, I think that 
what excites me so much about cryptocurrency is back when I was covering all the national security stuff, it just blew my mind how much money was going to things that struck me as unconstitutional and not very intelligent and just kind of like mean stuff. Like, why are we doing this? This is just unfriendly, you know, <laughs> like to spend this much money on drone manufacturing when we have people in the United States who are malnourished, you know, kids in certain urban areas actually malnourished. That strikes me as unfriendly. So uh, eventually I got out of the business of commenting on national security and, and punditing punditry about it because it's so depressing. And it seemed to me like there was no solution. Like, how do we get out of this? These people have all the power. They're spying on us with the NSA. And like, it seems like they've already won the game, like the military industrial complex that Eisenhower wa warned about some like, what, 70 years ago almost, that that has literally come true in certain parts of the world and has become this economic force that selects our politicians and selects what we do policy-wise. And it's all about keeping up demand for drones and keeping up demand for bombs and keeping up demand for uh, tanks and software that spies on people and all the military stuff. So Bitcoin, when I first heard about it and then was actually convinced that it wasn't a joke so several months later when I was you know, given a proper tech explanation of it, uh, I was like, oh wow, you know, if we can undermine these criminals' ability to manufacture money out of thin air and then force us to transfer our very limited time alive as human beings, we have to transfer our waking time for dollars when we work. And yet most of the dollars seem to go effortlessly. Billions and billions of dollars go to war and go to defense contractors. But as a person in the economy, we can only kind of go for the scraps. We're not given the, the kind of uh, access to the pipeline that Jamie Dimon and the other two big to fail banks get. We don't get that, that Federal Reserve pipeline. So to me, it seemed like a great kind of indirect way to just make all this stuff go away at some point, you know? By over time, people are gonna choose currencies that are not created by government, that are just created by either agreement or network power or whatever people decide on. Uh, so I think it's huge. I agree with you about not wanting to play into a system that is on its way out. I just want to participate because it's not yet dead. Until we get to a point where a stranger can't put another stranger in a shower and burn them to death, uh, until we get to that point, I guess we have to interact with the shitty system and get less shitty people to be in there. But the longer term view, of course, is that this will not make sense to, to our children or to our grandchildren. What is this? Is this a Confederate bill? Like, this is cool looking, but what does it do? Who made it? Who decided this has value? Hopefully that's the direction society heads in. And I think longer term, it definitely is. Yeah, I, I hope, I hope, I hope to see the flourishing of competing governance because I do have to agree, disagree with uh, disagree with one statement that you made, which is that the uh, uh, the future, the money of the future, won't be created by government, and all currencies are governed in one way or another. All systems are governed, uh, and so I believe that the future toward a humanity that is more peaceful and less inclined to violence is simply that our govern governance structures compete and that we choose from among them. Because as I said before, like I might actually slap my manservant around and cause like tyrannical governance in our household if I didn't know that I have to compete. And so I really think that cryptocurrency is the way forward toward competing governance because, so I used to be like an avowed anarchist, right? And in some, it depends on how you define the damn word, whether or not I would say that I still am. But I used to believe that governance itself was somehow problematic. And then I start learning more about uh, like networking and computing and these sorts of things, basically how cryptocurrency works. And then it's like, okay, actually there is no escaping governance whatsoever. If you define governance as simply the process by which changes or decisions in a group of more than one person is made. And so if that is governance, well, then governance is awesome. Governance is, I mean, you and I had a small form of governance when we agreed to do this interview together. You know, I agreed that you would start the thing and that I would be on your show and whatever. It was like a tiny little minuscule governance contract that we made. And so governance is awesome. And for some reason, governance seems to go hand in hand with currency, okay? And so I really think that competing governance is coming about in real life as a result of competing cryptocurrencies. That's, that's really interesting. Definitely uh, the agreements that people make, that's what makes up the most of society, you know, like financial contracts saying when your book sells so many copies, your royalty rate will be this. Or if you, if you damage this apartment before your lease expires, then you owe us this. It's like a very, that's what society is, is a system of agreements. And now that we can write those agreements using blockchains, you know, the people who don't understand smart contracts at all, and they're like, oh, Seaman, you and your smart contracts, that, that's exciting to me. To get that kind of comment is actually exciting because it means we are like truly in the pioneering stage where the idea of a smart contract has only been in this society for months or maybe a year at most. And it's still not really a mainstream idea. But the fact that people can mock me and be like, you and your fucking smart contracts, that's where cryptocurrency was at a few years ago, right? Like you and your made up internet money. 
But then eventually people are like, oh shit, there's actually like a real utility to having something that is not decided by a central bank that's political in nature. Uh, so I think similarly, similarly, they're gonna see that there's value in people being able to make agreements and there being a kind of arbitration process in terms of when that time amount has gone by or when you receive that amount of money, the code does something. The money either goes to you or it gets clawed back. It does what it's designed to do. I think there's gonna be a real need for that in the future, especially as people start to see some of these governments become less reputable. You know, if you're in South America and you need to make some kind of multi-million dollar business deal with somebody in America or somebody in China, uh, a smart contract would be the way to go because if you write something on a piece of paper and then you know I don't honor my end of the contract. Are you going to come to the United States and then like try your case in U.S. court, or if the person's in China, are you going to fly to China and learn the nuances of you know however their court system works? You better you need to have a lot of money at stake to do that. Otherwise, you're losing money, right? If the person owes you less than like ten thousand dollars, it wouldn't make sense to do that. But with smart contracts, even if the agreement is you're coming on my show at twelve thirty, you know in the future. It could be one of those agreements where if you don't come on, a certain amount of money gets clawed away from you, you know, and this will make people more punctual. This will make everybody more reliable. And uh, you can even make agreements with yourself. If I, if I don't lose five pounds this month, you know, half a Bitcoin is being I'll clawed away from me. I'll half a Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. I want to, I, we're running out of time, but I want to get your views on what's happening in like the fiat markets and the stock markets, because I'm looking at my other computer screen and the Dow is down 214 points right now. It seems like this slide just won't stop. You know, the Dow's lost now like 2,200 points since the start of the year. It seems like the trend has not ended because that's a, you know, we're down to 15,900 uh, points on the Dow, 15,922. Huge loss of value and even bigger in China since the start of the year. To me, it seems like the money's got to go somewhere eventually. Where is it going? Hmm. I would love to provide commentary on that. Uh, I don't. I don't follow fiat uh, markets, um, so I really, I'm unable to provide commentary on that. I don't know. That is that is an interesting question. So to go back to the idea of competition, I'll just give you. This isn't uh, again for people out there watching. None of this is financial advice, but I'll give you my theory, and that's okay. that. Uh, you know, at the beginning we were talking about how you and I aren't direct competitors, but then you're like, well, even if if we are, that's fine. I think that to a, a pretty large extent, tech stocks in the US and in China are gonna come into competition with blockchain projects like Bitcoin uh, because you know, it's essentially serving the same function. If I'm a millennial and I have a certain amount of discretionary income that I want to risk in exchange for a high amount of growth, then I wanna risk it in a legitimate way. I don't wanna go to a casino, but if I wanna do that in a responsible way, the tech sector in both the US and in China has historically been one of the best places to put your money. But since that is now not one of the best places and it's losing value rapidly, I could see tech savvy people with discretionary income in both of these countries, both here and in China, being like, hmm, this thing called Bitcoin keeps going up or at least is maintaining value. And some of these other blockchain projects keep going up when all of our stuff is cratering. Maybe it makes sense to make this lateral move out of tech sector stocks and into projects that are basically tech companies that are monetized through a blockchain. I think that's very possible within the next year or two. But again, not financial advice, but when people ask me what's what's happening, I think people are losing faith in stocks that have totally unrealistic P to E ratios. The price to earnings is off the wall. They're overvalued. So that's coming down. And then hopefully people are escaping into more interesting stuff. But uh, thanks for joining me today. and. Uh, thanks everybody who watched. It looks like the follower or the viewer count has shot up quite a bit. Just remind people where to check you out on YouTube and elsewhere. Well, you can check me out at, at thedailydecrypt.com and then that links to all of our other uh, profiles. Great. Well, thanks again. And uh, for all you guys out there watching, I still believe in Bitcoin very much. It's just I want to call out people who don't seem to they don't seem to get it. You know, it's like when you fetishize this object and or like everybody's gonna wanna just, just work for this and work for little scraps of Bitcoin for their 0.01 Bitcoin tip. While you sit on your thousands of Bitcoins and you're like, go out, innovate. And then you see other projects that are innovating and you criticize them. That doesn't seem to me to be like, what's at the core of, of decentralization or open source or crypto. I think the whole point of crypto is like everybody creates something and if it's something everybody agrees is really useful, then people start to consciously and voluntarily use whatever that thing is. I think that's what's so great about this is no commission is saying, 
now Bitcoin's the one or now Litecoin is out. You know, there's no like central banker telling us that. It's just all of our decisions cumulatively are creating these values. That to me is exciting. And so I think we want to we want to be very careful about becoming like a kind of new uh, church kind of institution where it's more about ideology than about the numbers and about the software code. Uh, but thanks again for watching. And uh, that is it, everybody. I do expect to see lots of alternative currencies emerge. Um, in fact, over time I've revised my opinion and now I believe that instead of hundreds or even thousands of alternative currencies, we're going to see hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of alternative currencies. And all the way down to single person pseudo currencies that are reputation management schemes or um, funding schemes for individuals. Um, novelty coins and fad coins and meme coins and uh, coins created by five-year-olds and six-year-olds in school to trade with their friends. We're going to see millions of currencies. However, all of these currencies uh, will come as successors to Bitcoin and uh, I think many of them, the ones that will achieve monetary value, will achieve it in collaboration with Bitcoin synergistically. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we see several coins backed by Bitcoin, where Bitcoin acts as the reserve currency, as the store of value for long-term consideration. Over time, we may see Bitcoin uh, be used mostly for very large value transactions, very much like the gold standard. And then more nimble currencies take on a more transactional role for day-to-day -day purchases and things like that. But if they do so, they only strengthen Bitcoin. They don't replace it.
when I first heard this flat earth subject, I dismissed it without even giving it a second thought. But more recently, at the beginning of 2015, I ran across a few flat earth videos again. And while looking into the fake moon photos circulating around, I saw that people were claiming that the images from Earth from space were fake as well. Pretty soon, the flat earth subject became viral online. And after looking at the Apollo missions one night and coming to the conclusion that they were nothing more than a huge con game, it jarred my memory about something. And for a very specific reason, I decided to look deeply into the flat earth without just dismissing it blindly as so many do. Why did I look into it this time? Well, I do pray for knowledge and wisdom and discernment, but maybe the recent Apollo footage I watched helped. However, I live near a very large lake, Lake Ontario, and I happen to remember going to the beach as a kid and looking across the lake and seeing New York State coast off in the distance. I never ever thought anything about it ever, except I remember it being there when I went to the beach. Now, I've been to that beach a hundred times over the years, and once this topic gained more prominence in early 2015, the first video I saw explained the curvature of the Earth and what it's supposed to be in inches per mile. And it resonated with me because I remember that I could see clear across the lake to the other coast, something that broke all the sphere Earth rules. So with NASA fakery on my mind and the memory of seeing this coastline that supposedly was too far below the horizon for me to be able to see it due to the curvature of the Earth, I re-examined the Flat Earth Theory. And as unbelievable as it seemed, it started to make a lot of sense, especially since I did distinctly remember being able to see that far coast basically any time I was at my local beach. And as I've said, I've been there hundreds of times over the years. But even so, I went back to the beach recently and stood at the shore. I looked south and guess what? I could see the New York State coastline just like I remember. Now I googled the distance and it was approximately 36 miles. I learned what the curvature of the Earth is supposed to be exactly at that distance. And according to the people that believe in the sphere, I found out that the coast should have been buried below my ability to see it by almost 900 feet. That part of the New York State coast had a top elevation of less than 300 feet. So that left at least a huge 600 foot discrepancy. And even more because I could see some of the height of the far shore. Was something really wrong with the reality that they've been selling us ever since we were born? Well, I ended up becoming a little fixated on proving or disproving the concept. And at first, I truly thought disproving the flat earth would be rather easy. I thought there had to be a reasonable explanation why I could see so far beyond the so-called curved barrier. I learned about light refraction and superior mirages. I learned about perspective and horizons. I learned about how our eyes work. I viewed dozens of similar experiences on YouTube. I listened to experts and people who thought they had logical but spherical explanations. In fact, I tried for a few months to debunk the concept and just couldn't. The more I looked into it, the more sense it made and the less likely that the sphere model we've been spoon-fed since birth was a reality. It's just flat out wrong. And as more people shared their experiences and proofs online, it only added to my growing, pretty much unwavering belief that the world is not what we've been told. And learning about how our eyes work and how perspective work helps a lot with understanding sunrises and sunsets and ships disappearing hull first at sea and other supposed sphere earth proofs. I can't say for certain what shape the earth is or how big it is, or if there's an Antarctic ring or a barrier beyond it, or if it's an infinite plane. Maybe everything we theorize is not complete. There are so many possibilities that it blows the mind. And the flat earth has no real complete standard model because it's all based on us finding out things for ourselves. We agree on the facts and certain basics, but the rest is only hypothetical even if it seemingly makes sense. And as the evidence mounts for both the flat earth and against the sphere, I wanted to create a special place where folks can learn and share what they've learned with other supporters. Differences of opinion are certainly going to come forth and should be expressed openly. But remember that the goal of my videos and their corresponding threads is to provide the opportunity to use each of us to learn and grow in any area that any of us has a problem in. If there is a thing you can't understand, then ask. Someone will have an opinion and we can go from there. If you have a point to make against what is considered an accepted flat earth fact, please provide any relevant links or supporting proofs or videos. I am currently under the impression that the entire space program, even the low Earth orbit and all that is there, is really just a sleight of hand trick by a group of illusionists that have swindled the public, the governments of the world, the media, and us into believing a lie. Everybody, a small group of corporations and cabals have almost complete control over the entire financial, educational, high-level governmental and media systems, leaving it up to real armchair scientists and normal people that can critically think and recreate experiments themselves to independently prove or disprove prove any accepted line of thought about our reality. Look, I ain't the smartest man on the flat earth, but I ain't no dummy. I'm educated and I never ever questioned or ever thought of an alternative to a sphere earth until this year. It never entered my mind to question this part of our reality at all, ever. But now I question everything. I'm a Christian and I think I see the big picture. Thanks, Thanks for watching my video. If you'd like to see more proof against the heliocentric model and proof against the sphere, then make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if there's anything you disagree with, Make sure you leave a note below 
explaining exactly why. Remember, folks, follow the golden rule. God loves you. We'll talk soon. Esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's a rather a game. Uh, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important uh, to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key for example uh, blockchain.info for example la empresa blockchain.info luego imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo e imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, and for your friends, of course. Eso da motivación a la gente para aprender Bitcoin y... Uh, this gives motivation for the people to learn about Bitcoin. 
Y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente. And the game part uh, consists in the following. Explicas a la gente, mira, esta es la cla clave privada, que es la clave secreta. You explain to the people, look, this is the private key, which must be secret. And uh, you have it and uh, me. And uh, explicas, esa persona y yo mismo la tiene. Y antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años. First I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later explain. Después te expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. If uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these four years. So you lose this. That's the, this part of the game. Es la parte del juego. He creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons la gente tiene cuatro dedos. Y Solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in The Simpsons, people have a four fingers and only God has five fingers. Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunas imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount later, it can be big help. Uh, no solo para... Bueno, es un juego. <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So uh, it's, this is the game part, if uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person, but if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out, and it can be really... <laughs> bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada, y si por ejemplo, okay, first translate. Print and not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente, 
Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta, das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember, uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some bitcoin and you and this person doesn't have, have any so you have already this public address where they can send you bitcoin ¿Qué es bitcoin? Bitcoin es la primera moneda digital descentralizada. Los bitcoins son monedas digitales que puedes enviar a través de internet. Comparado con otras alternativas, Bitcoin tiene numerosas ventajas. Los bitcoins son transferidos directamente de persona a persona a través de la red sin pasar por un banco u otro intermediario. Esto significa que las comisiones son mucho menores, puedes usarlo en cualquier país, tu cuenta no puede ser congelada y no hay prerequisitos o límites arbitrarios. Miremos cómo funciona. Los bitcoins son generados en todo internet por cualquiera con un programa gratuito llamado Minero de Bitcoin. Crear bitcoins requiere una cierta cantidad de trabajo para cada bloque de monedas. Esta cantidad se ajusta automáticamente por la red, para que los bitcoins siempre sean creados a un ratio predecible y limitado. Tus bitcoins se guardan en tu billetera digital, que te resultará familiar si usas banca digital. Cuando transfieres bitcoins, una firma electrónica es añadida. Pasados unos minutos, la transacción es verificada por el minero y es almacenada permanente y anónimamente por la red. El software de Bitcoin es completamente abierto y cualquiera puede revisar el código. Bitcoin está cambiando las finanzas de la misma manera que la web ha cambiado el periodismo. Cuando cualquiera tiene acceso al mercado global, florecen grandes ideas. Miremos algunos ejemplos de cómo los Bitcoins están usándose hoy en día. Puedes comprar videojuegos, regalos, libros, servidores y calcetines de alpaca. Existen varias casas de cambio donde puedes intercambiar tus bitcoins por dólares, euros y más. Los bitcoins son una gran forma para que pequeños negocios y autónomos reciban publicidad. No cuesta nada empezar a aceptarlos, no hay cargos o comisiones y recibirás negocio adicional de la economía bitcoin. Para tus primeros bitcoins y más información visita weusecoins.com